Hello Internet. A few days ago, Dr. Jordan Peterson published a discussion with Sir Roger Penrose about quantum mechanics. Unfortunately, in that video, Sir Roger propagates some misunderstandings of quantum mechanics. In this video, I will explain why his main statements are wrong and why, contrary to Sir Roger's claims, there is nothing wrong with quantum mechanics. The three related claims we are going to refute are as follows that quantum mechanics is inconsistent as a physical theory, that quantum mechanics is a vague set of rules that leaves important things unclear, and that it is a problem that quantum mechanics does not tell us what constitutes a measurement. This video will be concise. For more details, check out my ongoing series about understanding quantum mechanics, which is linked in the description. Sir Roger's first claim is that quantum mechanics is an inconsistent physical theory. First some terminology. We call a theory incomplete if there is at least one true statement that cannot be derived within the theory. We call a theory inconsistent if a contradiction can be derived within the theory. In other words, if there is a statement that can be proved to be both true and false by the theory. Incompleteness and inconsistency are quite different notions. They are not equivalent at all. A theory may be incomplete yet consistent. The claim that quantum mechanics is inconsistent is remarkable, considering that quantum mechanics is the basis of all of our physical understanding today. To support his claim, Sir Roger would have to exhibit a contradiction derived from quantum mechanics, and he clearly does not do so. Lacking such evidence, his extraordinary claim has to be refuted. Over almost a hundred years, countless critics of quantum mechanics, including Einstein and Schrödinger mentioned in the video, have tried to produce contradictions from quantum mechanics, and they all have failed to do so. This leaves the question whether quantum mechanics is incomplete, as Sir Roger also alleges. Pioneers of quantum mechanics like Max Born considered this possibility because, in contrast to the earlier deterministic theories, quantum mechanics makes only probabilistic predictions. They also considered that quantum mechanics may be complete and that its probabilistic statements are all we can truthfully say about the laws of nature. From today's perspective, we have good reasons to favor this latter view. It has been shown that quite general classes of theories that make additional statements beyond those of quantum mechanics are incompatible with quantum mechanical predictions. The excellent experimental confirmation of the quantum mechanical predictions therefore rules out these classes of theories. From this point of view, it is one of the deep revelations of quantum mechanics that nature presents us with true randomness in observed outcomes. The probabilistic character of quantum mechanics appears as a necessary consequence of this randomness. A mathematical description of such randomness has to be probabilistic, since mathematics, consisting entirely of knowledge, cannot produce random outcomes. It can only describe them by giving all possibilities and their probabilities. This does not render the theory incomplete because there simply are no true statements to make about randomness beyond the probabilities of outcomes. However, Sir Roger formulates his rationale for calling quantum mechanics incomplete differently. He alleges that quantum mechanics would lack a good description of the measurement process. In particular, he calls quantum mechanics a vague set of rules because the Schrödinger equation does not describe the collapse of the wave function. It is correct that the Schrödinger equation does not describe the collapse of the wave function when we make an observation. Note that for reasons that will become clear later, I use the term observation here rather than measurement. Anyway, the statement by Sir Roger is correct. However, the Schrödinger equation is not all of quantum mechanics. Let's take a bird's eye view of quantum mechanics to see what the theory comprises. First. Quantum mechanics talks about observables, which is short for observable quantities. And it is essential that we start a quantum mechanical description 
by specifying the available observables. The observables are then represented by mathematical objects satisfying a particular algebra. This means we can calculate with these observables, we can add and multiply them and they satisfy certain equations among each other. Of great interest among these equations are the Heisenberg equations of motion, which describe the dependence of the observables on time. Equivalently to using the Heisenberg equations, we can fix the observables at a given reference time and use the Schrödinger equation, which describes the evolution of the quantum state psi with time. But all of this is only half of quantum mechanics. The other equally important half tells us how to make predictions about future observations using Born's rule and how to update our knowledge once we have made an observation by using the projection postulate. Born's rule and the projection postulate are essential for making quantum mechanics a physical theory because they connect the mathematical part of the theory with its algebra and equations to the actual physical observations we make. The projection postulate states that when we have observed a quantity uppercase x to have value lowercase x, our new state of knowledge is a projection of the previous state psi to the eigenspace of uppercase x corresponding to the observed eigenvalue lowercase x. This update of knowledge has gotten the dramatic name collapse of the wave function. But whatever you call it, the rules are both mathematically and physically precise. They are not at all vague as Sir Roger alleges. The quantum state psi is a summary of the observer's knowledge from previous observations. Psi itself is not an observable. Therefore, the change of psi in the collapse of the wave function is not a physical process. Physical here meaning, in principle, observable. The collapse is the mathematical embodiment of the change of the observer's knowledge upon registering the outcome of the observation. The abrupt change of psi in the collapse reflects that predictions about the future change immediately upon the reception of new knowledge. Therefore, it is no shortcoming of the theory that the collapse is not described by the Schrödinger equation, since the Schrödinger equation being equivalent to the Heisenberg equations just describes the time evolution of observable quantities while no new knowledge is being acquired. Regarding the alleged sweeping things under the carpet, I would agree that there is a pedagogical problem in that the concepts on this right-hand side are not emphasized enough in today's teaching of quantum mechanics. But that is a problem of pedagogy, not of the theory. In the previous paragraphs, I have already mentioned the observer. Indeed, the assumption of a conscious observer is fundamental to even give meaning to notions like observable quantities the probabilities of expected outcomes and the knowledge gained from observation. But note that our claim is not that consciousness collapses the wave function. We do not claim that conscious observation is something we do to the wave function. We only state that the collapse of the wave function represents something that we unequivocally know to be meaningful, the registering of new knowledge by the observer. No conscious being can dispute that that is a meaningful concept. But wait, where exactly does the observer enter the picture? Well, by specifying the available observables, we implicitly divide the world into the observed system made up from these quantities and the rest of the world, doing the observing. The conceptual boundary between these two parts is called the Heisenberg cut. We can think of the quantum mechanical description as being established at this Heisenberg cut. Here and in the following I will depict the observed system slightly blurred in order to remind us that due to the complementarity of quantum observables and the corresponding uncertainty, 
We cannot draw a picture of nature that is both faithful and precise. But where is the Heisenberg cut? In other words, what is the right choice of observables? This leads us to Sir Roger's third claim, namely that it is a big problem that quantum mechanics does not tell us what constitutes a measurement or observation in our terminology. First, it is correct that quantum mechanics does not tell us what constitutes an observation and what doesn't. It does not tell us where to place the Heisenberg curve. Furthermore, it is crucial for a quantum mechanical description to know where the Heisenberg cut is for that description. That sounds like a major problem indeed, but it isn't. Because the specification of the Heisenberg cut is an input we must provide in order to set up a quantum mechanical description, not an output emerging from that description. Let's make this more concrete by literally picking up a measurement device to measure the voltage of a battery. Where is the observation taking place here? Where is the Heisenberg cut? Is it where the test leads go to the battery? Is it at the inputs of the measurement device? At the analog to digital converter inside? Is it where the photons are emitted from the display of the instrument? Or where the cells in my retina react? Is it somewhere in my brain? Or is it maybe only when you hear me announce the result of 1.58 volts? Quantum mechanics does not tell us. It is our choice, and for each choice of Heisenberg cut, quantum mechanics gives us a physical description. The Heisenberg cut itself is not physical. It is a conceptual fiction, but one that is required for setting up a description and for talking about observables at all. Since the cut is not physical, leaving it arbitrary does not render the theory incomplete. Let's, for example, put the Heisenberg cut directly around the battery. We do this by specifying observables like the electric field, the voltage between the poles, and so on, and various internals of the battery, but nothing else outside of it. Of these observables, the voltage U is the one we choose to observe. If, on the other hand, we include the multimeter in the observed system and put the Heisenberg cut conceptually around it, we do this by specifying a larger set of observables. In addition to the previous ones, we now include all the internal physical quantities of the multimeter and the flux of light emitted from the display, which is one of the observables we choose to observe by looking at the instrument. In this more comprehensive description, we can analyze the physics of the measurement process facilitated by the multimeter. We find that the interactions of the multimeter with the battery give rise to states in which the multimeter subsystem is entangled with the battery subsystem. Applied to such entangled states, Born's rule predicts correlations between the voltage U and the photon flux phi emitted from the display. These correlations are what we call the operation of a working multimeter. It becomes clear now why I prefer to keep the terms observation and measurement separate. In the first description, what we call measurement of the voltage U is not described as a physical process, but rather as an assumed ability of the observer to immediately learn the value of the observable uppercase U. In this case, Measurement of U and observation of U are the same thing. In the second description, the voltage measurement is a physical process fully described by the Schrödinger equation. And the observation, which is treated by applying Born's rule and the projection postulate, consists in reading the display of the multimeter. In our terminology, the meaning of measurement therefore depends upon which description we choose. The term observation is unambiguous. Observation is always the registering of an outcome by the observer and it is always non-physical in the sense of being itself unobservable. 
In summary, it is not true that quantum mechanics cannot describe measurements. Whenever we are dissatisfied with applying the protection postulate at a particular Heisenberg cut, we can always shift the cut and treat a larger part of the process physically. Whatever apparatus we use, we can always choose to include it in the quantum mechanical description of the observed system. Even including the experimental physicists running the experiment, if we feel like it. There's nothing missing from quantum mechanics regarding the physical description of measurements. Considering all the possible descriptions, we must ask whether the theory is consistent. The arbitrary choice of the Heisenberg cut is fine, as long as different choices yield predictions that are compatible with each other. If we could arrive at contradictory predictions regarding the same physical question, that would make the theory inconsistent. The compatibility of predictions is a rather subtle point, because different choices of observables imply different assumptions. In our example, we could naively demand that the predicted probabilities to observe a given voltage range should be equal, whether we are talking directly about the values of the observable u, which we assume to be displayed by our multimeter in description 1, or whether we are talking about the observed patterns of light emitted by the multimeter display as in description 2. But such an equality is not quite the right condition because the two descriptions make different assumptions in regard to the questions being asked. Everything in a physical description that is not part of the observed system is assumed knowledge. We gain confidence in these assumptions by deriving predictions from them and then comparing these predictions to experiment. The success or failure of this comparison then causes us to raise or lower our confidence in the assumptions made. But even the most reliable assumptions only hold with a probability strictly less than one. And all predictions about an observable are implicitly predicated upon the assumptions made. The probabilities predicted by the theory must therefore be understood as conditional probabilities, applying only if the assumptions are true. In our example, when we inquire about the value of u directly, as in description 1, we assume that our multimeter works within its specification, has high enough input impedance, that the voltage u is within its measurement range, and so on. To be clear, these assumptions are not needed for the mathematical description. They are needed for the applicability of that description to our physical situation. Description 2, on the other hand, does not make these assumptions. It contains all the physical details of the multimeter, including all the ways it can fail to work. Thus, a question about the voltage U is clearly not exactly the same as the corresponding question about the displayed value. A comparison of the predictions of two descriptions only makes sense in the case that the assumptions of both descriptions hold. We must therefore compare conditional probabilities predicated upon the combined assumptions of the two descriptions. It is these conditional probabilities that must agree for the theory to be consistent. Formalizing this more precisely is quite a task. For the interested viewer, I provide here a sketch of how one could move towards a more formalized notion of physical compatibility. We cannot go into more detail in the scope of this video, but I hope you can see that, at least in principle, the arbitrary choice of the Heisenberg cut does not make the theory inconsistent. Sir Roger has certainly not presented any evidence of consistency conditions being violated. Our ability to consistently shift the Heisenberg cut furthermore implies that there is nothing physical going on at the Heisenberg cut that would be missing from the quantum mechanical description. In principle, there are no limits to the applicability of quantum mechanics. It applies to all of physics, including to the macroscopic world that we are used to observe. In practice, however, 
the full quantum mechanical treatment of macroscopic systems is too complicated. Luckily, and quite surprisingly, when we are analyzing a microscopic system, like for example the spin of an electron, we can usually exclude all the macroscopic measurement devices from the quantum mechanical description without introducing prohibitively unreliable assumptions. This is sometimes stated by saying that classical physics applies to macroscopic objects. That is a misleading way to say it, because the whole world is quantum mechanical, and macroscopic objects have many properties, including thermodynamical and chemical ones, that can only be understood based on quantum mechanics. A better way to put it is to say that we can usually assume all the properties of the macroscopic devices to be known and treat them according to the rules of classical probability theory outside of the quantum mechanical description. I call it surprising because one of the revolutionary insights of quantum mechanics is that classical probability theory does not generally apply to natural phenomena. There are cases in which the quantum mechanical predictions contradict classical probability theory. When there are multiple alternative paths leading to the same outcome, like an observable x having a certain value, and each path is assigned a probability, the classical theory tells us to add the individual probabilities in order to get the total probability of the outcome. This is in general wrong according to quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics states that each path must be assigned a complex valued probability amplitude. In order to get the total probability, we must add the amplitudes of the alternative paths and then take the square of the absolute value. The quantum mechanical formula differs from the classical one by interference terms, which can raise or lower the probability relative to the classical result. The interference terms depend on the relative complex phases of the amplitudes. The significance of these phases is equivalent to the existence of observables com complementary to the observables distinguishing the alternative paths from each other. Complementarity is most obvious in systems with very few degrees of freedom. Let's use the spin of an electron as an example a system with only two distinguishable states. As a reminder, don't take the images seriously. There simply is no way to picture spin one half correctly. The components of the spin vector along orthogonal axes are complementary to each other. If we know one with certainty, the others are completely uncertain. This is mathematically equivalent to the states of known X component being superpositions of states of known C component and vice versa. The relative phases in superpositions of states of known C component encode the value of the complementary X component and vice versa. Due to complementarity, predictions about the spin observables depend essentially on quantum interference terms. Lacking these terms, classical probability theory cannot describe the implications of our knowledge about the electron spin correctly. My video about the meaning of plus in quantum mechanics explains this in more detail. See the links in the description. In principle, every non-trivial quantum mechanical system exhibits complementarity of observables. It is therefore reasonable to ask why classical probability works for macroscopic objects? Why are quantum complementarity and interference not obvious to us? This question is often misleadingly phrased as why don't we see macroscopic objects in these strange superpositions, for example in multiple places at once? Such formulations are based on two misconceptions, namely that superpositions would be exotic cases and that seeing a superposition would mean seeing multiple outcomes at once. Neither is the case. Superpositions aren't special. In fact, 
any pure state of a non-trivial quantum system implies certainty about some observables and uncertainty about other observables with respect to which it is a superposition. Second, superpositions do not predict that we would see multiple outcomes at once. Instead, Born's rule predicts that when we choose to look at the uncertain observable, we will randomly find one of the possible outcomes. It is actually quite easy to amplify the uncertainty in a microscopic system to superposition states of macroscopic objects. Let's, for example, assume that we have a macroscopic apparatus for measuring the spin of an electron along a chosen axis. We first orient the device along the x-axis in order to measure the x-component of the spin. There are two possible results, which we are going to call left and right. We now perform the measurement and let's say we observe left on the display of the apparatus. We now know that we have prepared the electron with the x component of its spin pointing to the left. As already mentioned, this state is a superposition, a particular superposition of the spin known to point up and the spin known to point down along the z-axis. If we now repeat the measurement along the x-axis, it will give the same result left with certainty. Our state of knowledge about the electron spin is reproducible. We now leave the electron alone and rotate our apparatus by 90 degrees in order to measure the C component of the electron spin. As soon as we let the apparatus interact with the electron spin, the interactions facilitating the measurement of the spin will give rise to an entangled state that can be written as a superposition of states of the combined macroscopic system of measurement device and electron. This superposition does not mean that we will see the device displaying both results at once. The result will be either up or down. We just don't know which one it will be until we have observed the display of the apparatus. So the question is not why don't superpositions occur macroscopically? They do occur all the time. The question is, given that such superpositions occur naturally, why don't we ever care about the complementary observables for which these superposed states of the macroscopic system represent states of certain maximum knowledge? Why don't we know examples of such observables? The answer hinges on the relative phases encoding knowledge about the different values of such an observable b. For an observation of b to succeed, the phase relations corresponding to the observed value must remain stable for the duration of the observation. The stability of the phase relations is called coherence. What makes complementarity so difficult to demonstrate in macroscopic objects is the loss of coherence, briefly called decoherence, induced by the system's interactions with its environment. Typical macroscopic objects interact with their environment in countless ways that we can neither prevent nor control sufficiently. From a wider point of view, these interactions very quickly entangle the observed system with more and more degrees of freedom in the environment. From the point of view limited to the observed subsystem, this means that phase relations between states interacting differently with the environment very quickly become undefined. Strictly speaking, the information represented by the relative phases is not lost. It is simply spread very rapidly to ever larger and larger systems. One can show that under quite general assumptions, as far as the observables limited to the observed subsystem are concerned, the entanglement with the environment strongly suppresses quantum interference terms. This explains why classical probability theory works so well for the macroscopic world. With 
interference terms suppressed by decoherence, the quantum and the classical formulae for probabilities become approximately equal. See the cited paper for more details and calculations. So it's not that superpositions would somehow be confined to microscopic systems. It's quite the opposite. Entanglement spreads so rapidly to more and more degrees of freedom that the corresponding complementary observables cannot be accessed in practical observations. That's why in our everyday experience we are not used to complementary observables, which is also why complementarity seems so alien and unintuitive when we learn about it for the first time. Like all interactions, gravity contributes to decoherence. Maybe Sir Roger was referring to that when he said that there was a very clear mathematical calculation involving gravity regarding what he called the lifetime of a quantum system. Indeed, typical macroscopic systems have very short decoherence times, beyond which quantum interference becomes unobservable. However, I emphasize that decoherence just explains why probabilities satisfy approximately classical relations. Decoherence is not at all the same as an alleged objective physical process picking one of the possible outcomes. Decoherence does not turn quantum mechanics into a deterministic theory. No matter how small or how large the described system is, no matter how little or how much it interacts with the environment, quantum mechanics does never pick one of the possible outcomes. Even for macroscopic objects, probabilities predicted for two possibilities may well be comparable to 50%, indicating maximum uncertainty. Some people are very dissatisfied with that, because it means that we cannot identify quantum mechanics with nature, since nature presents us with outcomes, while quantum mechanics does not. This discrepancy has been called the measurement problem in a somewhat polemic attempt to put quantum mechanics at fault. However, if we take Born's rule seriously and consider that nature exhibits true randomness, it becomes evident that no mathematical description can derive the actual outcomes, since mathematics cannot produce randomness. It can only quantify it in terms of probabilities. There simply is nothing more to say or to know about randomness, randomness being the antipode of knowledge. Descriptions of nature cannot be the same as nature, since descriptions are made only of knowledge, while nature apparently is not. Those who complain about the measurement problem are really complaining about the randomness of nature, not about quantum mechanics. But whether nature exhibits true randomness or not is a scientific question, not one of philosophical preference. And the experimental verdict is clearly that quantum mechanics is correct about the randomness of nature. The dream or the nightmare of identifying nature with its mathematical description, of understanding nature as a mathematical machine, died in the 1920s with the discovery of quantum mechanics. Whenever we choose which observable to observe and actually make an observation, one of the predicted possibilities becomes observed reality. This transition from possibility to reality is not a physical process. It is itself not observable. Rather, it is a transition of the observer's knowledge. Note that such a transition of knowledge is not a new concept of quantum mechanics that could be disputed. It is self-evidently true in any description of nature at all that learning about the outcome of an observation constitutes a change in the observer's knowledge. Quantum mechanics just forces us to admit that we cannot say much else about this transition. In particular, we cannot identify it as a physical observable process. If we try to pick one distinguished Heisenberg cut and postulate that facts are objectively established at that interface, independent from which description we pick and independent from what we choose to observe, then we run into contradictions with quantum mechanical descriptions based on different choices. These contradictions arise precisely because of the complementarity of observables, or equivalently, 
because of quantum interference of probability amplitudes. As no deviations from quantum mechanical predictions are known, the experimental verdict is that we must accept that no choice of Heisenberg cut is distinguished. We can therefore only speak of established facts and reality in the context of a particular description with a particular Heisenberg cut and a particular choice of what to observe. This is referred to as the observer dependence of the quantum mechanical description. Note that the claim is not that different observers have different facts. It goes much deeper. We cannot even speak of facts and their equality or difference without committing to a particular description with particular definitions and choices of the observer. Because of this dependence, the question whether facts are different for different observers cannot be assigned any meaning. The only meaningful consistency condition we can demand is the compatibility of conditional probabilities discussed earlier. In summary, quantum mechanics is not compatible with the so-called realist viewpoint that there would be an objective pre-observational reality independent from the observer's choices that is then observed. That's why I repeatedly warned against taking images of unobserved concepts too seriously. Those images only reflect our ideas about nature, not reality. It might be more honest to always show the unobserved as an empty dark region, but it is just impractical to completely dispense with images when communicating ideas. A viewpoint compatible with quantum mechanics is that the results of observations constitute reality, where it is also understood that by reality we mean reproducible knowledge. Observation is not something we do to reality. Observation is what constitutes reality. Is it mysterious that we can apparently describe the world only by families of descriptions predicated on arbitrary boundaries between the observing and the observed, and that these descriptions cannot be based on the idea of a common objective reality? I'd say yes, it is deeply mysterious, but it is not inconsistent, and to the best of our knowledge it is not incomplete. That said, it is philosophically satisfying that quantum mechanics describes the world exactly as we experience it, as the inner experience of a conscious observer being able to choose and to observe only part of the world. If you liked this video, please comment and subscribe, and maybe even support me on Subscribestar. Also feel free to put any questions in the comments below. Check out my quantum mechanics series and stay tuned because there will be more about quantum mechanics on this channel. See you next time.